Back pain is no joke, especially when it involves bulging and herniated discs, as well as that associated nerve pain that people often refer to as sciatica. So in today's video, we're gonna take a look at actual discs on the cadavers in the lab, discuss what's actually going on with bulging and herniated discs, and again, talk about that collateral damage and symptoms when those nerves get involved. So let's do this. So first, let's talk about what a disc actually is. Discs are technically called intervertebral discs, and that's because they're found in between the bones that make up the spine or the vertebral column. And we refer to these bones as vertebrae or vertebra for singular. Now, the majority of the vertebrae have what's called a vertebral body, and this is the largest component of each vertebra, and it's kind of this block-like mass of bone and it's where the weight or the forces are distributed throughout the spine. And so we plop those discs in between the vertebral bodies of the vertebrae. Now, these start at C2 or the second cervical vertebra and the discs will continue down the spine and end at the sacrum, specifically between L5 and S1. Now, the discs will actually make up about 25% of the overall height of the spine. And it is true that you technically are a little bit taller when you first wake up in the morning because as you stand throughout the day and the discs deal with the compression, some of the watery component of the disc will kind of ooze out and the disc will get a little bit thinner and lose a little bit of height. But then when you go back to sleep at night, the spine gets decompressed and the central portion of the disc will get rehydrated. Now, I mentioned the central portion of the disc, so let's actually talk about some of the specific components of the disc because that'll help us understand how they function as well as what happens when they get injured. The outer portion of the disc is called the annulus fibrosus, and this is a tough ring of tissue made of fibrocartilage. The central portion of the disc is called the nucleus propulsus, and that's a pretty good name because we often think of things in the center or in the middle when we use the word nucleus, and propulsus because the nucleus propulsus is made of this pulpy, gelatinous substance, even has a watery component to it, which we hinted to earlier when we talked about water oozing out of the disc and the disc losing some of their height. And now we know it's coming from the nucleus propulsus. But the nucleus propulsus, as I say it so many times, is a nice little shock absorber for our spine. And you can think of the annulus fibrosus as this tough connective tissue ring that contains the nucleus or keeps it in the middle. Now my students will often compare the anatomy of disc to the anatomy of a jelly donut. And that's an okay comparison. I guess the problem is with the jelly donut is when you compress it, it kind of just stays smushed. But our discs are just so much cooler than that. Our discs, when they deal with that compression or that smooshing force, they have that ability to bounce back or recoil. So now that we understand the specific components of the disc, this is gonna help us more clearly understand the specific disc injuries. But before we get to those disc injuries, I do wanna mention one other important thing when it comes to discs, and that is discs are avascular meaning they do not have a direct blood supply. So you might be thinking, well, how do these tissues or these discs stay alive if they don't have a direct blood supply? How do they exchange nutrients and waste products? Well, discs will get their nutrients through diffusion from blood vessels that are close by, or in other words, from blood vessels that are supplying structures that are near the disc. For example, like the vertebrae or those vertebral bones we talked about earlier. And this is enough to help maintain the disc, but we're gonna see that this is a limiting factor when it comes to disc injuries and even healing from those injuries. And so you might also think, is there anything I can do to increase the blood flow or the blood supply to the discs? And you're not gonna grow tiny little new blood vessels that are gonna penetrate into the discs. That's not gonna happen. But through certain stretches and mobility exercises that can occur through things like yoga, we can see that the spine or the disc can get decompressed and that we can increase the general and overall blood supply to those blood vessels that are close by and this could potentially help speed up the exchange of nutrients and waste products with the discs. But did I mention yoga? Yes, I think I did. Which allows for one of my classic shameless segues to say thank you to the sponsor of today's video, Yoga Body Teachers College. They specialize in science-based online certification programs for yoga teachers, yoga breathing coaches, yoga trapeze teachers, and stretching coaches. If you're interested in starting a new career, or a side job helping people improve their health, overcome injuries, manage stress, and live their best lives longer, Yoga Body's courses might be right for you. Yoga Body takes a science-based, business-positive approach to yoga. They turn passionate students into successful teaching professionals. Since 2007, Yoga Body has certified over 23,000 teachers in 41 countries. 
They are backed by Yoga Alliance, American Council on Exercise, and even American Council on Education, making them one of the only schools in the world eligible for college credits. Yoga Body has put together a free report for you called How to Choose a Yoga Teacher Training Program. You can access it immediately at yogabody.com forward slash IHA. So let's talk about some of these disc injuries as well as some of the terms that are used to describe the injuring of a disc. Because you've probably heard of all sorts of terms. Things like herniated, bulging, ruptured, slipped discs. But do these all mean the same thing? No, there are some distinctions here. And the two most commonly used terms to describe an injured disc in medicine are bulging and herniated discs. A bulging disc is when the outer portion of the disc, that annulus fibrosus, is bulging outward. Yes, I understand it is earth shattering to say a bulging disc is bulging outward, but there is an important distinction here. With a bulging disc, the annulus fibrosus remains intact. Just think of it as kind of getting smashed and stretching outward. But one of the best analogies that I heard to describe a bulging disc, think of a hamburger where the meat patty is too big for the bun. And the bun, the top of the bun and the bottom of the bun would be the bones in this analogy, and the meat patty extending beyond the margins of the bun would be the disc. And it doesn't have to involve the whole circumference of the disc. It can, but many bulging discs just include anywhere from 25 to 50% of the outer circumference of the disc. So you could maybe think of it as 25 to 50% of the meat is only extending beyond certain margins of the bun with our wonderful food analogy. Now, bulging discs tend to occur with age, as that cartilage becomes more dehydrated with age and those tissues lose some of their strength and integrity. A herniated disc, on the other hand, is when that annulus fibrosis actually gets cracks and tears in it, which will then allow the nucleus propulsus to protrude outward. Now, a herniated disc is synonymous with some of those other terms like a ruptured or a slipped disc. Now, this often occurs with certain acute injuries, say somebody lifts improperly and they rupture or they herniate the disc. But keep in mind, an aged bulging disc is also going to be more at risk for herniation. Now, a herniated or bulging disc has got to cause a lot of pain, right? Well, yes and no. For example, there are situations where say someone went in for imaging for like an MRI that had nothing to do with back pain or a disc issue and they just incidentally find through that imaging that the person had a couple of bulging discs that they weren't experiencing pain from. Compare that to something that happens more suddenly, say someone is lifting something improperly and they herniate the disc right then and there and feel that immediate pain. Now there's some reasons for these distinctions here. One is that the discs actually don't have a ton of pain receptors. And because there's not a lot of pain receptors, it typically is gonna take something a little bit more severe and more sudden to really get those pain receptors fired off. So that gradual bulging of the disc that can happen over time, as long as that bulging disc doesn't irritate surrounding structures, it could potentially go unnoticed. As compared to that other situation where somebody's lifting and they tear that annulus right then and there, rupture the disc, that's gonna cause that immediate pain. But even still, a lot of the pain that's associated with it, and sometimes it's the majority of the pain that's associated with disc issues, is when that bulging or ruptured disc irritates or compresses surrounding structures. Those surrounding structures could be blood vessels, ligaments, and of course, the nerves. The intervertebral discs are in close proximity to spinal nerves which originate off the spinal cord, and the spinal cord is located within the vertebral canal, sometimes referred to as the spinal canal. These nerves will exit the canal through a hole called the intervertebral foramen. And again, this is in close proximity to the discs. Now, disc bulging or herniations and the potential collateral damage that they can impose on the spinal nerves could happen at any spinal level that you would find a disc. And remember, we said that was from C2 down to the sacrum. Now, these principles of nerve irritation and nerve impingement can generally be applied to, again, any level where you'd find a disc. But we're gonna focus in on the most common areas where you find disc bulging and disc herniations, and that's in the lower lumbar region, specifically L4 and L5. So here we are zoomed into the lumbar spine of Cornelius' the skeleton. You can see the L4 vertebra, the L5 vertebra, and the sacrum down below. You can also see the disc between L4 and L5 and the disc between L5 and the sacrum. And of course, the L4 spinal nerve, the L5 spinal nerve, the S1 spinal nerve, 
and even those S2, 3, and 4 spinal nerves down below. So let's say you have a bulging or a herniated disc that's compressing or irritating that L5 spinal nerve, or maybe even the S1 spinal nerve. What would some of the symptoms be, and how could you figure out what specific spinal level or spinal nerve is being irritated or compressed? Well, you could go straight to an MRI, but I feel like that's a little bit of cheating, at least to do initially, because a skilled clinician can actually get a pretty good idea of what specific spinal nerve is being compressed by doing some testing just in the office or in the clinic. There are these things called dermatomes and myotomes. A dermatome is an area of the skin that's innervated or served by a specific spinal level or spinal nerve. So there's L5 that controls a specific area of the skin. S1 goes to a specific area of the skin. So the clini clinician would test those specific dermatomes associated with that spinal level for things like numbness or tingling or other abnormal sensations. Often the pain can radiate to those areas as well. There's also the myotomes I mentioned. A myotome is a group of muscles that are innervated by a specific spinal level. So you could test those muscles that are innervated by say L5 for maybe some weakness. The challenge of that muscle testing is the majority of muscles in the human body are innervated by more than one spinal level. For example, the hamstrings are innervated by L5, S1, and S2. So if the L5 spinal nerve is being compressed, the hamstrings would still be getting signals from S1 and S2. So that might be harder to tease out if there's any weakness in that muscle when you're comparing like the good side to the bad side. But whenever we talk about rupturing, herniated, or having a bulged disc in these lower lumbar areas and compressing nerves like L4, L5, and some of the sacral nerves, we have to have a discussion about sciatica. The term sciatica is used to describe pain that's radiating along the pathway of the sciatic nerve. And this can be caused by compressing a nerve root at L4, L5, S1, S2, and or S3. And the most common cause of this is having a bulging or herniated disc below L4 or below L5, compressing one or more of those five spinal levels that I just mentioned. Now what's interesting is that many clinicians actually prefer not to use the term sciatica when discussing these issues and prefer to use a term that's a little bit more accurate called lumbar radiculopathy. Radiculo just means nerve root, pathy just means disease state or an abnormal condition. And sometimes they'll use the phrase lumbosacral radiculopathy if a lumbar and a sacral nerve root is being compressed or affected. And so the reason for these distinctions is that when you compress one of these spinal nerves through a herniated or bulging disc up in this region, the sciatic nerve hasn't even been formed yet. The sciatic nerve forms lower down in the pelvis and it gets contrib contributions from these five spinal levels. L4, L5, S1, S2, and S3 all send branches or contributions to form the sciatic nerve lower and that sciatic nerve will emerge in the gluteal region underneath a muscle called the piriformis and then we'll continue down the back of the leg. So you can see why if we're just affecting say the L5 spinal nerve, that's not technically compressing the sciatic nerve yet. And so that's why some prefer that distinction over just calling it sciatica, even though the pain can run down through that sciatic nerve. Now, there's two other things we have to cover here. One is you might think that if we had a herniated or bulging disc below L4, that it would actually affect the L4 spinal nerve but typically it doesn't. It actually compresses and affects the L5 spinal nerve. Why in the world does that occur? The other thing that you might have been wondering or thinking, we've talked about compressing sacral spinal nerves. If you look down on the sacrum, there's no discs there. So it obviously has to occur from here or here, but how is that happening? Well, to help us understand those questions, that is a story of development while you're developing inside the cocoon of love that we call the uterus inside of mom. So this developmental story is specifically about the spinal cord, and this picture is going to help us with that story as well as help to answer the questions that we just posed. So let's orient ourselves to this picture. This is a posterior view of the lower spine. You can see the L4 vertebra, the L5 vertebra, and the sacrum, and then we've got these nerve roots coming down. The blue are the lumbar nerve roots, and the red is just representing the sacral nerve roots. Now, I did mention this is a posterior view, so in order for us to see these nerve roots, you'd have to do some cutting. So we have a L5 vertebra to show you here. And so in order to see those nerve roots, we would have had to cut here as well as here and pull that segment of the bone off so you could see those nerve roots running through that vertebral or that spinal canal. We've even got a little makeshift cardboard disc where we've got a poor little nucleus propulsus herniating out. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. But you might be thinking, well, we're looking in the spinal or vertebral canal here. Shouldn't we see the spinal cord? And the answer is no. The spinal cord in an adult actually ends 
at L1, L2, right at the superior border typically of L2. In an infant or a newborn, it goes down as far as L3 and L4. But what you're seeing is that the actual spinal cord segment, say like the L5 spinal cord segment, isn't lining up with the L5 vertebra or bony segment there. Now, that wasn't always the case. When you were developing inside mom, there was a time where the L5 spinal cord segment did line up with the L5 vertebral or the bony segment there. But something occurs called differential growth. And what that means is that the vertebral column or the spine grew faster than the actual spinal cord. And so to accommodate that differential growth, these nerve roots had to grow out longer and to again accommodate that differential growth between the spinal cord and the actual spine itself. And so this group of nerve roots actually got a name called the cauda equina as it resembled what they thought of a horse's tail. But this anatomy and these relationships will help us answer those questions that we posed. Remember we said a herniation of the L4 disc that's associated with the L4 vertebra, you'd think that it would compress the L4 nerve, but I said typically that L4 nerve gets spared and you can see from this relationship how that herniation that I've drawn here would actually affect the L5 nerve. And if I come back to this little makeshift drawing that I have here, typically the herniations are posterior lateral, so posterior and just slightly to the side, and that's how we've drawn it here, as well as down here. The disc that's associated with the L5 vertebra, or below it, you can see how it would spare the L5 nerve, but compress the sacral nerve. And that answers our second question, how can you have sacral nerve issues when there's no discs to herniate in the actual sacrum. Now, some of you might be taking this even further, thinking, well, what if that herniation was even greater or larger or just even more central? And you could see if we just moved it slightly more medial or had more of a central herniation, you could affect even more of those sacral nerves. So hopefully this picture can kind of give you that idea, is at least give you that visual, how you can affect certain nerves, spare other nerves, and even affect more sacral nerves than you might actually anticipate with no discs actually being in the sacrum. Thanks for watching everyone. If you're interested in potential treatment options for back pain, including sciatica and disc injury, we cover some of that in our previous back pain video. So we'll link that to this video. Also, if you're interested in pursuing anything with yoga, check out the link in the description below with Yoga Body, the sponsor of today's video. And as always, like, subscribe if you feel the need, leave some comments below, and we'll see you in the next video.